In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Well, we're in the last Sundays of the church year, right in the middle, second to the last Sunday of the church year, and that makes perfect sense for a mission presentation, a sermon about missions. Uh, the Old Testament reading is from the last chapter of the Old Testament, and uh, even more so, uh, it is perfect for a sermon about missions. So we're going to focus on Malachi chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. Uh, the last Sundays of the church year are great for talking about missions because in the last Sundays of the church year, we focus on the end times and the return of Christ. Now, once Christ comes back to the world to judge the world, how many chances are people going to have to believe in Christ after he comes back and judges the world? None, right? Zero. And so these last Sundays of the church here, which, fo which focus on the return of Christ and his judgment of the world, are wonderful for talking about missions. And even more so the Old Testament. The Old Testament reading from Malachi uh, does at least three main things. Now, interestingly enough, what we heard in our Old Testament reading this morning are the last verses of the Old Testament. The very last verses. Uh, Malachi is the last book of the Old Testament. It's got four chapters, and the fourth and final chapter has six verses, and we heard them. Those six verses don't surprise us in terms of what they speak of. Number one, it talks about the law of Moses given on Mount Horeb or Mount Sinai. Well, that's not surprising because the giving of the law is uh, you know, one of the most prominent features of the Old Testament. Secondly, uh, Malachi talks about uh, Elijah, the prophet who would come before Christ and before the final judgment of the world. And that, that Elijah uh, turns out to be uh, John the Baptist. And so the Old Testament reading uh, links us to the New Testament. Not surprising, the last few verses of the Old Testament taking us forward to the New Testament. And then the third theme in these six verses this morning is a rebuke of Israel. <coughs> that doesn't surprise us either. Uh, we all kind of know the basic history of the Old Testament and the people of Israel. Uh, first of all, there comes that, that second greatest salvation event of the Bible, and that is the passing through the Red Sea. God saves the people of Israel by taking them out of slavery in Egypt and taking them to the Promised Land, and on the way, they pass through the Red Sea. It's a, it's a picture of baptism. It's the Old Testament picture of baptism, so to speak. Uh, they passed through water, and they were saved. Likewise, when we are baptized, uh, we pass through water, and we become children of God. They were slaves. God brings them through the water, and they become somebodies. We are slaves to sin, and in baptism, passing through that water, we become the children of God. So there's those three themes. Uh, the, the commandments of God from uh, Mount Sinai, they link to the New Testament, and then also a, a rebuke of Israel. Because Israel, after that, the day after that passing through the Red Sea, they started to, to backslide. And their whole history from that point on was sliding away from God. As a matter of fact, God even sent the prophets, like Malachi, the last of the prophets, he sent them to warn the people uh, that they were slipping away from his word. So uh, we'll uh, talk about that. Um, another really wonderful thing about uh, the Old Testament reading this morning is that it has all kinds of picture language. I'm a simple-minded guy, and I am a visual learner. And so I love the prophets, because the prophets have all of these word pictures. And there's two prominent pictures that we're going to spend some time on this morning. Uh, number one is this great fire that comes and destroys everything. What's that? It's the last day, the judgment of, of God on the world. And this great fire comes and destroys everything in its sight. And then there is the exact opposite picture, 
Um, the prophet describes you and I, the children of God, like calves skipping through the meadow. Young calves, first learning how to walk. So <clears throat> we have those two pictures. And by the way, those two pictures are the two words that God has for the world. A word of law, there is a great fire coming that's going to destroy everything, and a word of gospel, but my children are filled with my joy, and they skip like calves. Well, before we get to that, um, I'd like to make a, a couple of introductions. First of all, I bring you greetings uh, all the way from Africa. I, I and my wife, we live here in America, a matter of fact, even in the state of Washington, just down the coastways and on, uh, in ocean shores. But uh, our work that we are supporting is over in Africa, in Kenya. And I bring you greetings <clears throat> from Reverend James May, who is the director of Lutherans in Africa. Uh, he uh, just announced a couple of years ago uh, to several of his students over there in Africa that he and his family are going to live the rest of their lives in Kenya. Uh, and what a great blessing that is. So he brings you his greetings. Likewise, the board of directors of Lutherans in Africa, it's Missouri Synod Lutherans just like you from all over the country. Uh, our board is, uh, in, and members are uh, representing lots of different states and they bring you your greetings as well. Uh, I. Uh, go around the country and I do this uh, several Sundays a year, exactly what I'm doing now, which is to, to talk about one of my passions, which is Lutherans in Africa. Uh, and so um, we'll, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Lutherans in Africa is a unique mission group. It's not your normal mission group. We are not planting churches, nor are we sponsoring mercy trips where people come and build houses or, or collect eyeglasses and hand them out. Um, we don't do that either. We do one thing and one thing only. We teach the Word of God. And I want to explain to you why it is that we do that. So uh, in Africa, there are all kinds of Lutherans. There's 20 million Lutherans in Africa. Now, that's just a number, 20 million. You know, what does that mean? Well, Eight million of those Lutherans are in one country, Ethiopia. There are eight million Lutherans in one country in Africa, Ethiopia. That's more Lutherans than in all of North America. And I'm talking about Lutherans of every stripe, you know, uh, liberal, moderate, conservative, whatever, any Lutheran you can find. There's more Lutherans in one country in Africa than in all of North America. There's a lot of Lutherans. And there's 360 million Christians in Africa. So the need is not so much to plant churches, although that goes on as well. We are starting new churches in Africa, <clears throat> just like we are here in America, uh, you know, even though we are, a, a, at least for now, a, a Christian nation. Uh, we still have a need to plant churches. But in Africa, um, there is a different need. The pastors in those churches, many of you know more Lutheran doctrine than the Lutheran pastors in Africa. That, that is shocking. When I when I learned this, uh, I was amazed. And there's a good reason for it. So Africa was evangelized around 1850. That's uh, about 170 years ago. Um, you know what was going on at that same time? Our beloved Lutheran Church Missouri Synod was being founded. Yeah, 1848. And how, how, did, how did the Missouri Synod get founded? It got founded by a Lutheran pastor from Germany by the name of C.F.W. Walther. Any of you ever been in the Walther League? Anybody ever grew up in the Walther League? Yeah, I see a few hands out there. I was never in the Walther League by the time I was in, that, that, that's the old term for uh, youth groups in the Missouri Synod. I was in Lutheran Youth Fellowship and I, I think it's had about nine different names ever since then. Uh, but in the old days, it was the Walther League. I was not a member of the Walther League, but I'm a product of the Walther League because my mom and dad met in Walther League. <laughs> so I'm a Walther League baby, you could say. All right, so CFW Walther, uh, after whom the Missouri Synod is named, he, he and a bunch of other Lutheran pastors left Germany. They left Europe in the middle of the 19th century. And you know why they left? because they were being persecuted for preaching the true word of God. You see, in Europe, uh, Christianity has lost Christ. A couple hundred years ago, the Christians in Europe began to give up on the truth of the Bible. 
Well, let's put it all together now. It was about that time, the middle of the 19th century, when those Christians in Europe who were losing their belief in the Bible were still in Africa evangelizing and starting new churches. They were evangelizing the Africans. And so Europe slowly loses the truth of the Bible and, and the Africans follow with them. So these Lutheran pastors that I'm talking about, of these 20 million Lutherans in Africa, when they go to the seminary, it's a mixed bag. It, there's only maybe about one out of every 10 professors that actually believes the Bible is truly God's word. And so even though there's 20 million Lutherans in Africa, they have not been taught the truth of God's word or the pure gospel. Um, uh, they have been not been taught well. The pastors have had mixed training. And then to make matters worse, there, are, there aren't enough pastors to go around. And so every Lutheran in Africa gets to see a pastor about once every six weeks. And in the meantime, that pastor looks around his little congregation, or might even be a large congregation. There are many large congregations there as well. And, and, he, and he taps his finger on somebody's shoulder and says, hey, you, you can read and write. You're going to preach the sermon for the next five weeks until I come back again. How would you like that if your pastor asked you to do that for the congregation? So those, those they call them evangelists, they have had no training whatsoever. That's the crisis in Africa, and that's why Lutherans in Africa was started 10 years ago. And the Lord has richly blessed us. So people not knowing the true word of God, people not knowing the pure gospel of God's forgiveness is a huge problem, according to our prophet today, Malachi. Because Malachi says, and listen to these words, Surely the day is coming. It will burn like a furnace. All the arrogant and every evildoer will be stubble. And the day that is coming will set them on fire, says the Lord Almighty. Not a root or a branch will be left to them. Everything's going to be burned. Not just the trees, but even the roots of the trees. The day is coming, says Malachi. This is the end of the Old Testament. We're about to move into the New Testament. A day is coming when the Messiah will come and he will judge the world. That's the, the first uh, word picture that Malachi gives us in chapter 4. Um, and so you need to be prepared for that day. And the only way to pre be prepared for that day is to know Jesus as your Savior. And these pastors in Africa don't know the gospel well enough and don't believe in the truth of the Bible. They need to be taught the Bible um, so that they can teach their parishioners about this day that is coming. So it says, uh, Malachi says, not a root or a branch will be left to them. Now, I retired after uh, 30 years in the parish a couple of years ago to, to do this work for Lutherans in Africa part-time. And uh, because I'm semi-retired, I have lots of hobbies. And one of my hobbies is gardening. We have any gardeners out there? Anybody like gardening? So one of my hobbies is gardening. And you're good Lutherans. Pastor, I, I want to tell you they're good Lutherans because they would only raise their hand this high. <laughs> We Lutherans, you know, we're, 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 you know, kind of quiet, humble people, you know. <laughs> so, so I do some gardening, and, and I, I joined a group, uh, and the group is called the Ocean Shores Garden Buddies. So I am a proud card-carrying garden buddy, all right? I'm your garden buddy. So uh, we're, we're doing some work on the main boulevard in Ocean Shores. What, next time you're in Ocean Shores, you have to drive down by the Shiloh Inn and, and see the, the work we've done. So anyway, uh, I was doing some, some transplanting and, and the, the boss lady, she said, yeah, you can have these yucca plants. Anybody know anything about yucca plants? I'm from the Midwest and it's too cold there for a yucca plant, so I'm so happy that there's all of this stuff you can plant out here in the wonderful Pacific Northwest. So she said, you can have those. So I took some and some of them had been chopped up. And they have a very woody, big root system. Uh, and the fact of the matter is, I think if there's any plant that's going to survive the, the judgment day, it's going to be a yucca. Because you can cut those things up and just throw them on the ground and they'll start growing. It's amazing. But, but Malachi tells us, even the yucca plants, the roots will be consumed and will be nothing but stubble on that day. 
And now here's, here is the kicker. And what's going to be destroyed on that day? Uh, all those who are evil and arrogant. Oh, phew. That's not me. That's the other guy. Except for the fact that our Lutheran hero, St. Paul, says, I am chief of sinners. And if St. Paul is the chief of sinners, that makes me like double, triple chief of sinners. If he's, if he's the chief, I, I'm worse than St. Paul. And so we are all evil. And so Malachi's first word for us today is because we are evil, we shall be destroyed. Are we going to become ashes? Yeah. Unless Christ comes first before we die. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. I said that at countless numbers of funerals. We're going to be ashes. Even the yucca plants won't survive that terrible heat of that oven. And yet, there's one other word picture that I want to uh, uh, point to, and I, I mentioned it earlier. Right after that, Malachi says this, but for you who revere my name, now that sounds pretty fancy, revere my name. Uh, trust me, you revere God's name. Well, we don't always act like it. But if I ask you, has Jesus died to pay for your sins? And you say yes. That is the greatest reverence you can pay to Jesus' name and to God's name. To say, yes, God, I believe that you sent your only son to pay for my sins. So those who revere his name are the sons of righteousness will rise with healing in its rays. Ah, the healing rays of sunshine. No one but uh, those who live in the Pacific Northwest value the healing rays of sunshine more than anyone else. We'll go for four or five days and it's foggy and gloomy and cloudy and rainy and then all of a sudden the sun comes out like it is right now and you feel that healing ray. Jesus is the son of the sons. He's the greatest healing son of all and he has healed us with this forgiveness of his sins and, and, the, and then the picture goes on. And you will go out and frolic like well-fed calves. I'm from Iowa. And I've seen the calves frolicking in the meadow. And they start to frolic just hours after they are born. And they're skipping around and jumping. Because they're just learning that they can do that. Now, <clears throat> in today's world, we kind of have to translate this a little bit. And instead of calves... Now, you may not have seen a calf uh, frolic, but I bet most of you on the internet have seen today's version of the frolicking calf, and that is a baby goat jumping up and down. Because <laughs> next to the cat videos, it's the baby goats jumping up and down that are popular on the internet, you know? That is the picture of you and me in the love and forgiveness of God. You are God's child. Jesus loves me, this I know. You revere his name. He loves you. He has forgiven you. Even if you don't feel like it. That is the gospel. I don't feel like God loves me. Well, you know what? The gospel is that even though you don't feel like it, he loves you and has forgiven you. Really? Yep, that's the gospel. And it's that good news even though we are evil and, and we're going to be returned to ashes, someday he's going to raise us up into new resurrected bodies. Uh, the gospel is that we shall frolic like baby goats on a YouTube video. And we do frolic in his joy. That joy is yours. So I hope you will join with us in helping the Lutherans in Africa know this gospel. Because I have sat, I go, I go over at least once a year to teach, and I have seen pastors, pastors, whose eyes will suddenly uh, be bright and their countenance will glow because they're hearing and understanding the gospel, sometimes for the very first time, uh, because they have, haven't been taught the, the pure gospel. So I hope you will uh, join with us uh, at Lutherans in Africa, we need your prayers, we need your congregation support, we need your individual support. There's a, a basket in the, on the table in the back. Uh, you got an envelope in your bulletin, you can use that. 
Um, maybe you'll even help support sending your pastor over to teach because we have pastors from, from three places, Finland, Australia, and America, that come over and teach for a couple of weeks. And we could use your pastor uh, to come and teach these, these pastors who have been mistrained. Um, I hope you will join us in that. When the Lutherans in Africa, even the pastors, actually hear the gospel for the first time, they leap with joy like baby goats running around the farmyard. And it is a beautiful picture to see. Your support will help us give them that pure gospel. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.